Ellen, what an amazing collection of sessions up to now. I'm very delighted to be introducing our great set of panelists as well. We've got Dr. Martina Famaevu, who's VP Head of Data Science at Data Seed, that's now part of Verba. We've got Nick Welsh, Head of Programmatic and MIA at IAS. We've got James Murray, who you heard from earlier as well, Product Marketing Manager at Microsoft Advertising. And then finally, Sebastian Grants, EMEA Advertising Industry Relations Privacy Manager at Google. So I'm gonna get started on a more general note about machine learning and digital advertising. We've heard about how it's been part of digital advertising for some time now. So Dr. Martina, let's start with you. How has machine learning been an integral component of digital advertising so far? So uh, about uh, one, two years ago, uh, we saw the rise of generative AI, uh, as we heard earlier, like uh, which is indeed something very new. With these models, you can generate creative texts, images to help out with this type of liver in uh, the campaign, the creative one. But AI and machine learning in advertising uh, are not new. We saw machine learning models and autonomous auction bidding agents rising 20 years ago, back in 2000. We had the introduction of uh, real-time bidding in programmatic advertising around 2007. And with a greater integration of big data technologies, we saw improvements in recommendation algorithms, in targeting and personalization algorithms. We had pioneers in the space such as Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, being from the first ad auctioneers. We saw Facebook added uh, around 2009 ads in their business models, uh, which required leveraging highly advanced machine learning algorithms, uh, uh, deep learning uh, mechanisms. So I will finish with the current state of things where machine learning is widespread, is fundamental to almost all aspects of uh, digital advertising and all levers of uh, ad campaign uh, optimizations. Thank you, Doctor. And Nick, anything to add from an IAS perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, Martino hit the nail on the head. It's been around for a long time. Um, and from a programmatic perspective, um, with the advent of open RTB, D DSPs were able to go off, use machine learning to deliver kind of personalized um, ad experiences, but also able to kind of bid specifically on a user. Um, obviously, what that leads to when you see lots of money entering um, a buying ecosystem, it also then allows for um, bad actors to enter the bid stream and try and redirect some of that um, spend. So we saw advancements um, in media quality using machine learning. So from an integral ad science point of view, we were helping advertisers to identify um, that inventory that was viewable. So seen by a real human being, not by bots, so not fraudulent um, and delivered in safe and suitable environments. And, you know, it's, it's advanced even further with the advent of natural language processing to better understand context, which is a form of artificial, artificial intelligence instead of using keyword um, exclusion lists. Um, and that's even, that's advanced even more to frame by frame, um, second by second video analysis, again, enabling us to kind of um, understand and deliver marketing messages to safe and suitable videos, both in programmatic and in social environments. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Sebastian, Dr. Martina mentioned Google before, and obviously Google's been doing a lot of work uh, on AI. We've heard uh, a few things about the impact on digital advertising, anything you can expand on, both with a, uh, with a past and future facing uh, perspective? Oh, Sebastian, I'm, I'm sure um, there's an issue with an audio because we can't hear you. Okay, well, while you get that fixed, we'll go to James. Same question, James, about the past and future impact of AI and now generative AI on digital advertising. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we've seen and the biggest change that we've seen is what generative has done is taken it from being really the preserve of, of a few like really smart sort of techniques to something which has been completely democratized and, and now anybody uh, can use this kind of technology and it makes it incredibly uh, accessible and so with that comes you know a huge uptick in in adoption um, and huge opportunity then for starting to use these tools for so many different use cases like the the i think the 
we're just at the at the very beginning of this journey and we're just scratching the surface of what's possible but the more people that start to use these tools and integrate them and find new ways of uh using them the more sort of uh widespread and more scaled these these solutions can be and the other thing that we see you know increasingly is you we've had we've been trained for so long particularly when we think about search to kind of limit ourselves to just sort of keywords because that's the way that search engines have have worked um but we're now in a in a new era and a new opportunity where you can actually ask the question that's on your mind you don't have mm -hmm. to sort of constrain yourself with the way that you uh, ask a question and so i think the thing is as we all learn these new things as we as we start to um you know trust engines to be able to answer those questions we really want to ask we can be surprise ourselves with, with the, some of the responses they can come up with thank you james we'll come back to search uh, in a bit sebastian i'm pretty sure your audio works now so if you could go ahead uh, and test it that would be great yeah so first can you hear me yeah we can hear you yeah, perfect so okay but can you please also repeat the question because i was so focused with the audio setting that i didn't uh, get the question Sure, we're, we're, we're talking about the past impact of machine learning on digital advertising and now what's changing in terms of the impact with generative AI. Well, I think if you look at um, all the developments, we, we heard so much that um, I think we at Google, we invested at, uh, in AI for over a decade and uh, we've been an AI, an AI first company for a long time. And um, if you look at, um, for example, some stats already in 2021, we have a AI powered uh, bidding feature called smart bidding. And already like three and a half years ago, more than 80% of our customers use this feature. And also in, in 2020, we released uh, Google Analytics, which used Google AI to help fill measurement gaps. So you can see how AI has been an uh, essential part of many uh, advertising products already for, for a long time. And uh, we see f further development and integration to all our products now and in, in the future. So, and uh, it, as Shashank and all other panelists uh, or presenters mentioned, uh, it will be very important for everyone in the industry to keep up with user demand and uh, accelerating creative capabilities and, and so on. So I think this is just the beginning of the journey and what we've seen already starting a couple of years ago will only accelerate in the future. Yeah, and it was really fascinating to hear about unlocking creative capabilities and not expending resource on things like resizing or creating a horizontal video to a, a vertical surface. So really interesting to see the progress being made there. Uh, James, we'll go back to you for a second on search. Uh, you mentioned this earlier. To what extent are LLMs likely to replace search in the search funnel? And also, do you think there's space for digital ad inventory within AI-based solutions? Yeah. So I think the if we answer the second part first, I think they there absolutely is space and so uh at microsoft we've had ads sort of built in as a core part of the uh co-pilot experience of the sort of the generative ai uh interface and chat interface from day one and uh the reason frankly why we do that is because these tools are very uh expensive they're very difficult to run they they require a lot of processing and computing power and so ads is one of the sort of core ways of <clears throat> offsetting some of that cost uh in terms of sort of monetization uh, but we also fundamentally believe that you know this is a new way and a new era for advertisers to be able to reach consumers at the point of where they're having these really uh, deep, rich, nuanced uh, conversations, far more so uh, than they've been able to previously in the sort of the, the classic search uh, dynamic. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of sort of replacement, you know, I, I think maybe eventually in the future they, they may go on to replace, but certainly for the short term, we don't see these sort of generative AI or LLMs or, or uh, chat experiences replacing search rather it is additive to search um, we still think there is a, a place for um, sort of traditional search to exist uh, and in fact data that we have suggests that you know journeys which include both uh, co-pilot and sort of traditional search uh, there's an uplift in terms of click-through rate on ads and, and sort of the engagement rate so I think we are um, seeing them as as a sort of companions that can work together. 
uh, that can complement one, one another rather than replacing. The one, one core critical thing about LLMs is they're only as good as we've heard from other people as the sort of the data that's there to, to back them up. And so one of the reasons why these are so strong when you sort of complement them with search data is that it grounds it in reality. So rather than the language model just going off and, and sort of predicting and guessing what the answer is, it can be grounded in sort of actual factual stuff that it can get from the internet. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, to Google is synonymous with the search online. What is your perspective here? No, I think from, from our perspective, I think search will not be replaced. I guess it will be different, probably better. So uh, one of the reasons why we began investing deeply into AI many years ago is because we saw the opportunity to make um, search better. And uh, now we're using Gen AI to make search smarter and simpler. So in the US, we've already started rolling out a feature called AI Overview, which makes search way more conversational and provides more comprehensive answers from a single search. And um, uh, which is a great res um, example how this can um, develop uh, further. And also, if you look at how search in general can uh, will evolve, we are also innovating around visual search. So. Um, Search has never meant to be to be just constrained in a search box. So if you, for example, you see a pair of sunglasses um, that you like, you can now circle to search on your Android device and get a result. So snap a photo of a flower and uh, get told what it is and so on. So you see um, how AI can be applied to different ways, how like um, how search can, can be used. And also I think when it comes to LLMs, they work quite different to um, like a search engine. We know LLMs have this challenge of hallucinating. And when it comes to search, we want it to be really fact oriented. We want it fact based. So finding here the right um, balance. And uh, we like to say that like LLMs or uh, like tools like Gemini are a great way like to get inspired for creative ideas. And when it comes to like really fact based, it should like we recommend still using the traditional search. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. Dr. Martina, we'll go back to you with the next question. What are the main concerns regarding AI and its adoption by the industry? Uh, there are different types uh, of, uh, of concerns. I will mention uh, uh, just a few. Uh, I think um, number one uh, is uh, the, the privacy, ensuring user consent and the compliance with data protection regulations, safeguard always, of course, uh, personal information. Uh, very relevant, the security uh, concern. We need to protect data from, from breaches, ensure secure storage. Always we have the, the bias type of, uh, of concern. We need to understand address biases in data, prevent any unfair, let's say, outcomes uh, in AI models. Uh, the transparency type of concerns about providing clear communication, clear explanations on uh, data collection on resources needed to process, uh, let's say, this uh, big volume of, uh, of uh, data, usage to maintain trust and accountability. And uh, uh, the legal, of course, uh, compliance, always we need to follow certain local, certain international laws and regulations. To conclude, uh, there are indeed lots of concerns, uh, but I would say that there is so much space to use AI in a manner uh, without infringing privacy of end user. There are alternatives. There are alternatives right now in the industry that there are in uh, uh, in key conversations uh, that are happening. There is uh, the notion of contextual, for example, signals in data set. Uh, this is a, a fundamental thing that uh, uh, we are interested uh, uh, in and we are using different types of attribution mechanisms like we uh, heard earlier about the, the measurement uh, type of uh, uh, of things. So um, lots of concerns, but I believe there are ways to tackle those uh, in the right manner. I think that's really important to highlight. I think with any new structural change to any industry, especially digital advertising uh, that handles a lot of uh, user data, we're going to have concerns uh, coming with adoption. Uh, but I want to get back to the topic of uh, addressing these concerns and what can be implemented as a safeguard uh, later down in the discussion. Before that, Nick, anything to add here with, with respect to concerns? Yeah, I mean, just looking at it through a, a media quality lens and, and touching on a point that Oliver from Statista made earlier, 
the advent of kind of gen ai is just democratized kind of content creating creation so mm -hmm. we're going to see a proliferation of um content as a direct consequence of um gen ai and again where there's dollars we're going to we're going to see bad actors and there's now you know a, an even greater or easier way for bad actors to enter the bitstream so you know data quality and relevance is also super important there's going to be a proliferation potentially of low qual quality content impacting on journalism um, and we'll need you know ai on the other side such as natural language processing and kind of deep learning to kind of better understand and decide what content is quality um, that's going to re lead to better results. You know, mm -hmm. um, content that's been generated specifically for um, attracting advertising dollars typically have very poor conversion rates. So we know working with, um, you know, when we released our, our made for arbitrage um, segment, when we did our own analysis using total visibility, which has impression level transparency into the supply chain, we could see that conversion rates on quality sites were 174% higher than on MFA sites. And we are gonna see more and more MFA sites, You know, simply having an exclusion list to avoid established domains isn't gonna be enough um, as MFA becomes more sophisticated and the generation of um, that type of content becomes um, exponential. Mm, that's very insightful. We've also got a great question from Oliver in the chat that I'll leave uh, for the Q and A at the end. Um, next sort of area is addressing these concerns and building responsible AI systems. And to, for that, I'm going to turn to James and ask you outright, what does responsible AI mean and what level of oversight and safeguarding can be achieved over these systems? Yeah, so I think this, you know, is something that every one of us in, in the industry, all of the um, technology companies are kind of grappling with. And for us at Microsoft, responsible AI is a set of principles that we think about how do we ensure that we are developing these technologies in a way that is kind of good good for everyone. And so we have these principles which actually address a lot of the things that Martina was talking about in order to ensure that uh, AI is um, fair, transparent, countable, reliable, inclusive, uh, and sort of uh, maintains high standards of, of privacy and security. And so, you know, I think the thing is that we, it's quite easy to come up with a sort of a framework and a set of principles and, and you can put them on your website and make them look, uh, you know, like you are uh, doing the right thing, but it's not just a, clearly, it's not just about sort of saying these things, but it, sort of the actions that go behind them. And so, you know, for me, one of the interesting things hearing <clears throat> some of the earlier presentations, um, my, my degree is in, is in philosophy. And so I, I never thought that I would be, listening to somebody using Plato's cave as they um, were earlier. Um, but I always dreamed of, of being hired as a as a philosopher sort of uh, by big companies to kind of make sure that they were doing things ethically and then got quite uh, disappointed when when my degree was basically useless. Uh, but now, lo and behold, in, in sort of 2024, you know, we are actually hiring uh, philosophers and ethicists and people whose job it is to ensure that before any AI product goes out of the door and sees, you know, like meets uh, actual consumers, you know, that we have these rigorous sort of checks that that nothing is able to to kind of go live until it's passed an ethical uh, checklist of um, are we accounting for things like eliminating bias? Is this inclusive to all users? Is it um, fair and transparent? Uh, so for me, that's really heartening as sort of actual action of, of these things kind of becoming a reality. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think is the, you know, from a data and security perspective, um, Microsoft has set down a sort of a uh, tenet that, that privacy is a human right and it's something we take extremely seriously. And so one of the ways that we're making that a reality is a promise that if you use any of our artificial intelligence, if you use any of our AI uh, across any of our products that your data is your data. And that what that means is that nobody at Microsoft can access that. We will never use it to train over any of our models. 
Um, and so that sh should sort of give people the reassurance that they need that actually they can use these technologies to do some of these amazing things that we've talked about, uh, but in a way which is sort of safe and compliant uh, and is not going to be a, a data risk. Uh, thank you, James. So that uh, coverage of uh, Plato's uh, cave came from Sam, a very much valued member of our AI working group. And he brings uh, that kind of content to every session that we do. We've got some great discussions going on in that working group. And I'm very happy that we have people that appreciate that kind of contribution as well on this call. Uh, Sebastian, we'll go to you next on Responsible AI again. Yeah, so I think what, what James um, said is super important. So I think every company um, that is working uh, or investing heavily into AI um, should really articulate principles um, that put beneficial use, users, safety, and avoidance of harms um, over like above business considerations. For us also, the, the goal is really to make AI helpful for everyone so that we can really use this amazing technology to improve um, the lives of as many people as possible. So our principles are like, we also um, published a set of uh, principles that guide our uh, development of AI already a long time ago. So also to make it sure that it's socially beneficial, we don't wanna um, uh, create or reinforce bias have set the privacy right from the get-go. And um, we really feel that, that the only way to be really uh, bold in the long term, meaning that we can maximize um, the positive benefits of AI in the long run, means that we really need to be responsible uh, from the start. And if you look at a model like Gemini, for example, um, mm -hmm. these are large AI systems that are trained on a huge amount of um, data. And an example of being responsible here from the start is making sure that the raw data uh, that you put into the system doesn't contain any errors or does really represent users and doesn't really uh, create bias right from, from the beginning. So mm -hmm. being responsible from right from the beginning is, is key to make it socially beneficial for everyone in the long run. Fantastic. And that sets us up great for the next question, Dr. Martina. How should bias in training data be handled? And is it a matter of removing this bias from the data, monitoring outputs? How exactly does one developer uh, control an AI system for bias? So we can see the issue of bias from two different perspectives. The technical engineering, let's say one, and the end product business one. From a technical standpoint, we have certain um, uh, tools, certain mechanisms in, uh, in our hands. Uh, we have data auditing per processes. For example, we can uh, uh, audit training data sets to identify and understand existing biases even before using them. Uh, we have bias mitigation techniques. We can apply techniques such as uh, data balancing, resampling, augmentation to reduce bias within the data. Especially in the ad tech industry, we have highly skewed data sets. We have mm -hmm. uh, we see the problem of balanced data sets over and over again. Uh, there are solutions to that. We can collect data also from diverse sources. At least how we do it in data cities from the typical internal DSP logs to unlock contextual signals. But we also use external sources that help us understand more, for example, uh, uh, categorization of apps. In terms of data pre-processing and feature engineering, I heard earlier, I think it was uh, uh, James and, uh, um, and Nick who were uh, saying uh, about the quality of data. What we put into our AI and machine learning algorithms, it's even sometimes more important. Uh, we, we have this rule in the data science industry, the garbage in, garbage out. So we have to always ensure uh, that a big amount of time and effort will go there to ensure reliable and robust data. And um, with uh, the business, let's say, standpoint, we have two key uh, things that we can do. Active monitoring. So, uh, yes, we always should monitor AI outputs for any biased behavior, take any corrective actions as needed. And last but not least, I'm a big proponent of diverse teams diverse personas, diverse roles. Uh, we need to involve these kind of teams in the development process uh, to provide you know, different perspectives and help identify potential biases that maybe one role cannot catch uh, 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 easily than another uh, role. 
Great point on diverse teams. And thank you for providing technical detail as well. Let's go back to a more basic level. Nick, if you're a digital advertising professional, what can you do to stay ahead of the curve and ensure that you emerge a leader after this transition uh, that's caused by AI? Oh, you're on mute, Nick. So AI can't help me find the mute button. Um, I'm sure we can get a fix for that at, at, at some point. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm very conscious that, you know, digital advertising professionals, it's a very broad um, term, right? So I'm I'm going to look at this um, from the, the lens of a marketeer, digital advertising professional, someone who's who's essentially buying planning, um, planning uh, digital campaigns. If please embrace it, embrace the freedom um, the AI potential um, has the, uh, on offer for you, creativity um, and the the efficiencies that will be that, that it will bring, but also be vigilant, right? We I think we're going to see a proliferation of um, content um, and opportunity coming into um, the 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 bid stream from a programmatic perspective or even from a social perspective. So make sure that you're working with businesses that are able to identify good quality um, inventory with real audiences behind it. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is about. What advertising is about is about sending a service um, or a message about a product to a, to a user with the hope that they'll buy it at some point in time. And they'll end up having a good relationship with that brand. So you want to make sure that you're doing that um, in environments where the, the audience is engaged. Right. So you need to work with businesses, I think, technology companies like Integral Ad Science that can help you navigate those complexities, um, that can understand um, and have solutions around um, removing deep fake from um, your bid stream, removing made for arbitrage sites from your bid stream that are able to understand um, context at scale using natural language processing. Um, mm -hmm. Embrace those technologies as much as the freedoms that generative AI that's gonna, is going to bring you. Perfect. And can I have a short answer to this question by James, Sebastian, Athena? Because I also have some Q&A questions I want to get to if possible. I'll go first. I think the the thing, the top tip I have is just, just to use these tools. Like um, as Nick said, embrace it. Um, but I would say treat these, the more you can treat these tools uh, as a collaborative partner rather than as a, as a tool, uh, the better you will uh, get something out of it because you will find that uh, the moment that you sort of uh, think of it as a sort of an extra person on your team, the more you will start asking uh, more complex uh, questions or asking it to do more complex tasks and you'll be amazed at what it can actually achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, to make it short, so I agree. Yeah, get familiar with these tools. For example, if you lose a model like Gemini, learn really how to prompt. There are some amazing guides out there that help you with it. So be curious and um, yeah, get familiar with the solutions so you get the most out of it. Fantastic, Dr. Martina. Uh, for me, about all the different roles from a software engineer, from a machine learning engineer to a marketeer, it's about reskilling, upskilling. Uh, like uh, uh, all the panelists mentioned, uh, get uh, more familiar. These things are brand new for everyone. Don't think that uh, the software engineer, the machine learning engineer has all the answers for you. So you need to collaborate more, uh, have this kind of cross-functional partnerships, and we can build great things together with uh, AI. Right, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to pose one question from the Q&A box. Uh, there's one question about the main focus of the AI working group, but since we don't have really much time to cover that, I think we'll follow up uh, in our follow-up materials uh, with respect to the working group. Uh, Helen, I know you've uh, turned on your camera, but if you give me two more minutes, I'd really appreciate it because it's a great question. Uh, code optimization, we haven't really touched upon this. Uh, we got a question from Oliver with respect to how impactful that is for a digital advertising company. Anyone here with some first thoughts? Uh, I think it, it has huge potential impact. Like anything, what AI can do is give you skills or, or uh, that you might not have. So if you're not a developer, being able to automate coding, that's that gives you a skill you don't have. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you are a developer, 
uh, what it can do is alleviate some of the more repetitive tasks and helps you focus on the sort of the higher, more more uh, concentrated stuff. So what it should do is it just means that we all rise up and the sort of the baseline just gets better. Mm -hmm. Dr. Martina, I thought you had some uh, opinions on this as well. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, like, look, the, the 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 answer to the pain of every engineer is uh, like back in the past was go to the Stack Overflow, spend one two days try to debug the the code. I think right now we are in an amazing uh, place, and uh, like uh, we can do in a much more efficient manner, much more fast manner, a debugging of uh, certain codes, of having new ideas whenever we are stuck in a certain problem. And so I can see it already in action. Uh, it's uh, extremely helpful. Uh, I think it's uh, already being discussed in, uh, let's say, the um, uh, the group of uh, uh, engineers, uh, software and machine learning engineers. So yeah, it's here to stay. And I'll add my opinion on this as well. I think one of the most efficient ways to learn a new library or a new language potentially is to ask AI to do something very complicated and then debug the code it gives you. I find that to be a very rewarding experience in terms of expertise. Um, Helen, uh, I'm sorry for going over time. Unless you're, you have any other thoughts, back to you. You're, you're good. I think that was valuable. Last question to be answered. Uh, a huge thank you, Dimitri, Matina, Nick, James, and Sebastian. I